livestock show, and and about every three seconds the microphone would cut off. <laughs> I'd turn it back on. Turn it back on. Anyway, um, so I learned this morning. Some of y'all know uh, Kim Maddox. Uh, she was she was a kid child, and she passed away from uh, Sunday night. Had a heart attack. So um, this. I didn't know anybody here knew her, but Dave asked me today. So his son and one of the, uh, her boys uh, ran around together. So she was a, they were cross-brand people, uh, but sad deal. Um, huh? She's probably early 60s, 60, mid-60s, not much older than that, I don't think. So. Do what? No, no, no. no. She was the mom. Uh, one of her sons and uh, his wife worked for me for a long time. Um, and uh, so the daughter posted that on Facebook early Monday morning, so I called Tommy, the guy, uh, one of her sons. Um, also, uh, Steve McFarland is home. He had an event. You know, Saturday I talked to him. He was really good. And then he went to the hospital Sunday night and uh, just got some odd pains, and they don't know what's wrong. But... Uh, uh, anyway, so y'all just pray for them and keep praying for Phil. Uh, he's going through. He's only got nine treatments left. And there's just a whole bunch of people dealing with a whole lot of stuff, huh? Carl, really. There's a lot of people, a lot of people dealing with uh, just strange stuff, strange stuff. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for, uh, I, I tell you, as many times I'm in and out of the hospitals, I'm just thankful that for another day, Lord. Uh, and, and so every day is a new day, and I just ask you to just guide and direct me the paths I need to take. Uh, we lift up Carl to you and Steve McFarland and Jeff and uh, Phil and uh, Kim Maddox's family, so many people, Lord, that uh, we know from our church that are struggling with things. And uh, But, Lord, we know that uh, all of those people that I'm aware of know you, trust you, follow you in spite of what they're going through. And so, Lord, that's an example for us when we, we have storms in our life that rise up. Uh, Lord, we just uh, uh, thank you for what's going on down there at the Cherokee County Barn with that Junior Livestock Show. It is just so much uh, encouragement to see those young people. Uh, spend time uh, raising those animals and showing those animals. They put so much pride in, into what they're doing, and to see them, see those that, uh, that win ribbons for all sorts of things, uh, well, it's just an excitement to them. And, and so, Lord, I just thank you for all the parents down there, all the sponsors. Um, it's, it's just a lot of fun to, uh, to go down there and experience that. So thank you, Lord, for our people that are down there helping in the concession stand and doing whatever needs to be done and picking up trash or whatever. Um, Lord, be with us tonight. We, we, we hit the Hallelujah Trail in Revelation. We've gone through all the judgments. We talked about the church again, and we haven't talked about it for a while. And so uh, be with us tonight. We talked about that in Chapter 19. And uh, we just uh, want to thank you for loving us like you do uh, in spite of who we are. Thank you for the cross. And as we approach uh, Resurrection Sunday, Resurrection Week, Lord, let us be mindful of that because we're going to have people here on Sunday morning those Easter people that, that uh, come to church maybe once, maybe twice a year. And uh, so, Lord, I just pray that uh, you feel we'll just uh, make, make them feel home, make them feel like they're part of this family, and just share the simplified gospel to them, Lord, about you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I had a, had a lot of fun today. I got to talk to, uh, so we've got the AFCC uh, wants to uh, start contacting all these pastors. They're like 200-something churches under our umbrella, and there's a lot of pastors that uh, never come to uh, 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 clinics or anything like that, and so um, when I was on the board in 2012-2017, we tried to initiate something like that, uh, uh, and, and just never did happen, so now they got this great idea they want to start doing that, so I got to I talked to five different guys today uh, from Alabama and Louisiana, and some in Texas, and uh, just to encourage them, just to, because everybody needs to be encouraged. Uh, some of those pastors got great churches. Some of them have really small churches. Um, so uh, that was a lot of fun. So let's talk about Revelation 19. 
uh, tonight, the second coming of Christ, the marriage uh, of the Lamb, the hev heavenly hallelujah chorus. So, uh, the chorus in heaven is is that that hallelujah. We're going to see that that word used four times tonight in in these first ten chapter uh, ten verses of uh, chapter nineteen. So we we have heard that hallelujah chorus. It was written by George Frederick Handel, uh, but may, maybe you've never heard the entire musical composition. Maybe just pieces of it at Christmas time, but he wrote the entire piece in 24 days. Uh, it's pretty amazing when you read, go through and, and read about it and, and, and hear it. Uh, the story goes that he hardly ate and barely slept during those 24 days as he wrote the, the Hallelujah Chorus. So it, what came out of that was just this beautiful musical interpretation of God's plan of salvation through the sacrifice of Christ. Most people don't know that. Uh, they, 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 they've never heard that, but that's what that was all about. Uh, it was performed in 1743 for the King of England, and the story is told that he was so moved that he rose to his feet during the first few notes. Uh, the rest of the audience followed the king's leading, and that birthed the tradition that is still followed today when the hallelujah, hall, hallelujah chorus is sung. We don't stand in honor of Handel. We stand to honor the Lord God Omnipotent. So as, as you go through the Hallelujah Chorus on earth, that's, kind of, that's where we're at tonight. And so can you imagine, I mean, think about what it's going to be like when Jesus uh, steps out of, out of uh, uh, heaven and, and uh, comes to earth and, and, I mean, is the real King of Kings, the real Lord of Lords. I mean, and we, everybody starts praising him. So um, the worship that's going to take place in heaven is going to be deafening. It's going to be like... Uh, uh, maybe an earthquake or maybe this, this loud thundering it, uh, it's so loud you can't even hear I, I equate it to uh, uh, I remember I was in South Louisiana and work, working around the gas fields down there and they had a blowout of a well that was drilled at 20,000 feet and so the, the, the noise so I'm, I'm probably 200, 300 feet from that, that blowout it melted, it melted the rig the four story rig just melted it and, uh, and so down there when they build a location they, they use these Boards are like two by twelves, or four, maybe four. They're big, long, heavy boards, and they build the location. And everything's so wet. And they said when that that well began to rumble, they 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 heard it rumbling. The boards, as they ran from the rig towards the road, the boards just started doing this like piano keys, and uh, so it, it was, and it was so loud that my partner and I, we were standing this far apart, yelling at each other, couldn't hear. Couldn't hear what we were saying, so it, it, it's going to be it's going to be loud. It's going to be joyous. Anybody ever been in Niagara Falls? So uh, there are uh, six hundred and eighty-one thousand gallons of water per second that flow over Horseshoe Falls. That's that's the the big horseshoe. The American Falls, it's like seventy-five gallons, thousand gallons a second. It's in, it's it's pretty deafening. And so when I was there, I, you know, you read all this stuff about these guys getting in these barrels and things. And going, <laughs> uh, I don't know if they were after a lot of praise or a lot of look what I can do or hold my beer or what that was. I'm not sure what that was, but it was crazy. So we see it throughout the word, throughout the Bible, that there's a lot of reasons, a lot of scriptures for us to give thanks to God. Uh, he's to be praised, first of all, for all the perfections of his glorious his glorious being. Uh, there are scriptures under each one of these. They're, they're one of the perfections he is to be praised for is his holiness. So glorious holiness. And God is always praised for his mercy. For his mercy. And his loving kindness is everlasting. Uh, I always think of loving kindness. I think of Lamentations 3 verses 22 to 24. His new mercies, his loving kindness is fresh and new every every morning. Uh, he's to be praised for his mighty works. Chief among his works is creation. And salvation. And the list goes on and on and on. So for all those things, God is to be praised for probably the most unexpected is for his destruction of the wicked. However, that, that's an important thing in Scripture, and that's what we've seen, we've talked about in the tribulation. Now, again, remember, the church is raptured. And as we start 19, the church has not been mentioned since chapter 6. So 6 to 18 
the church is gone. But now, here we are in 19. But the, the, the destruction of the wicked is, is an important thing throughout Scripture. So at the time Jesus' return gets nearer and closer, uh, you know, he told us about the signs. Uh, the disciples asked, what, what are the signs? And, he's, and he talked about birth pains. He talked about the abomination of desolation. He gave us some things to, to look for, and uh, earthquakes and fires and wars and rumors of wars. Well, we, we're seeing all that stuff today. And he said, when those intensify, uh, get ready. And so uh, from 6 to 18, chapter 6 to 18, we see this detailed description of God's cataclysmic explosion of judgmental fury, his wrath on the sinful world, those who have consistently rejected Jesus. And so God's fury began to be poured out on the earth when Christ, the rightful heir to the universe, received the title deed to the earth from, the, from his father. And as he unrolled that scroll and broke the seven seals, and by the way, there's nobody else on anywhere that can break the seals like David Koresh claimed he knew. Y'all remember him down there in Waco? <clears throat> when that happened, when he opened, he broke those seals, there was terrifying, the judgments begin to happen. And they are followed by even more devastating uh, fury uh, by the trumpet and bold judgments. So we, we, we know that the target, the target of God's wrath is what? It's on the Antichrist economic and political religious empire. And we talked about that. That's symbolized by Babylon. Talked about that in chapter 17 and 18. So the, the destruction, it, it, there was a great mourning. There was great suffering. There was great dismay on the earth. And, and when people were, were thrown into chaos and confusion, what, they, 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 they turned to the Antichrist. They, they didn't turn to God. He's still trying to, to get them to come to him, but that's not what they did. They turned, turned away from him. So now the destruction here in 19 turns to great joy in heaven. And so what's going on in heaven is exactly opposite of what's happening on the earth, um, all the, 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 the destruction that we see. There are a lot of people, uh, and, and that number grow, is growing. There's a lot of people that, that think that heaven's rejoicing over the destruction of Babylon is uncaring and it's insensitive. People have heard the word. Uh, we've had people, well, I've had people walk out of church here because they didn't like the word. Uh, I just, I'm not smart enough to preach or teach anything that's not in this book here. And so if you get your feelings hurt or get offended by what's in the word, that's not, that's not my deal. It's not on me. I uh, don't want that to happen, but but I'm I'm going to preach what is and teach what is in this book, and so that's pretty short sighted, uh, because it ignores the reality that everybody has had the opportunity, the greatest opportunity probably in the history of the world to hear the truth of the gospel, and yet they continue to reject. They've had the opportunity to repent. That's that blank to repent of anybody that's ever lived, and so. That they, they are going to go through some of these, the most unprecedented disasters during the tribulation, uh, which they acknowledge to be God's judgment. They, they come to a place where they know it's he that is exacting those judgments on the earth. They will also have heard the most powerful preaching uh, in the, uh, the gospel in history from the 144,000 144, Jewish evangelists. Uh, the two witnesses, which we don't really know who they are. Some people think it's Moses and Elijah. Some think it's Enoch. And it's, you know, but, but we really don't know that. Um, the, the, the heavenly host of, of the, the redeemed that are saved during the tribulation uh, and these powerful angels. But despite all that, they still remain unrepentant. And it's, it tells us that in the days of Noah, people, what were they doing before? Noah was warning them for 120 years. They're out there partying and dancing and drinking and carrying on. The same thing is going on today. So it would be like the days of Noah. <clears throat> so praise in heaven throughout Revelation. Here's a whole number of scriptures I've given you. It reaches a crescendo. It reaches a climax here in chapter 19. And so the rejoicing is not over the damnation of those who have rejected God. 
because he's he's going to remove those those sinners, the ones that are consistently obstinate to his word, that have consistently rejected him. Uh, but that's the time that God's going to be exalted. He's going to be placed on the throne. The earth is going to be restored to its lost glory. And heaven is going to rejoice because history is finally going to reach its culmination to the true king as he establishes his kingdom on earth. So in chapter 19, we see the church come to the most climactic time in all of its history. God chooses the picture of marriage. That's the blank of marriage to illustrate that glorious moment when we will become one with our Lord. And we're going to have one of those marriages here on Saturday night, right here. So weddings are meant to be beautiful. They're meant to be joyous, uh, full of joy. Um, I, I enjoy weddings. I, I love seeing uh, families come together and, and, the, and the rejoicing and the love and the, the happiness. And um, But when this marriage happens, nobody knows when it's going to happen. It, it's going to happen, but nobody knows when that's going to be. Only God the Father. Uh, the Father had set the date. Nobody knows the date. And anyone claim to know that, uh, they're pretty much speaking heresy. So let's look at the scripture uh, in chapter 19, verse 1. It says, here again we see these words, after this. And so we're talking about what, what that means. He's talking about after this or after these things. Uh, we've talked about that throughout. Marks the beginning. Those two words, when we see them, it marks the beginning of a new vision. Something big is fixing to happen. And so uh, it, just, it happens after the destruction of Babylon, chapters 18 and 19. Uh, 17 and 18, I mean. Uh, before the return of Christ uh, as he establishes his millennial kingdom. So John hears... He hears what sounds like the roar of this great multitude. It says, after this, I heard something like the vo loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying. And right there, uh, most of the commentators say they, they don't really know who that vast multitude is. But as we go on down, uh, uh, they, they identify them. And so, uh, they're probably angels. Okay, that's that blank. They're probably angels. So this, let's just call it this angelic chorus, opens with this very important word. It says, hallelujah, hallelujah. Salvation, glory, and power belong to our God. He is the sovereign, omnipotent God, and uh, it just means praise the Lord. That, that's what that word means. As a side note, it's interesting. The word hallelujah is not used in any other place in the entire Bible except for right here. Hallelujah. So it just talked about it's praise for God's judgment on the wicked oppressors of his people. And it's a word often associated with both the judgment of the ungodly and the salvation of God's people. <clears throat> so heaven rejoices specifically because salvation has come for God's people. Salvation has come for God's people. It expresses, uh, again, that judgment on, the, on people, the wicked people. Um, but with salvation comes glory and power that belong to God. So it's the, the, the coming of Christ is imminent. As believers, we understand that. We don't know the day, the time, or the hour. He just says, he's given us many warnings throughout Revelation and throughout the word. Be prepared. Be ready. Uh, in other words, be uh, uh, obedient. Uh, stay strong. Stay faithful. Be encouraged. And, 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 and fight the fight, like Paul says. Fight the good fight. So uh, that, that's what prompts the praise of these angels as they anticipate the glory of his, his kingdom coming. In verses 2 and 3 it says, uh, because, it says a continuation of one, because his judgments <clears throat> are true and righteous, because he has judged the notorious prostitute who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his servants that was on her hands. I'm going, to, I'm going to turn over here to Isaiah 34. I, I didn't mark that, so just, uh, oh, I did. That's my little notepad there. 34, 8, it says, For the, for the Lord has a day of vengeance. And then uh, in Romans, I think I talked about this on, on Sunday, briefly. In Romans 12, <clears throat> In verse uh, 16, it says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. In verse 17, it says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Verse 18 says, If possible, 
as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. I will repay, said the Lord. <clears throat> so, he says, he has avenged the blood of his servants with the destruction of the wicked. Verse 3 says, a second time, they said, hallelujah, her smoke ascends forever and ever. Forever and ever. So, the judgments are true and righteous. And they're evidenced by the destruction of the wicked, the wicked and, and Babylon. And Babylon deserves the destruction based on, on uh, the, the wrath of wickedness that they brought on the, on the earth. So the multitudes, they're praising God because he has made things right. He has avenged those who have been persecuted, uh, who have persecuted the church throughout the ages. So we, if we look for judgment in the world, <laughs> we're not going to see it. And if we look for justice in the courtrooms of America, tell me that doesn't play out to what's going on today. There's, there are some really scary things happening in, in the justice system today. But one of these days, we will say hallelujah. There's a God who still makes everything right. In spite of everything that's going on, uh, people are fearful. Uh, um, but we have to continue to just trust the Lord. Uh, he's got the plan. We don't have the plan. So the stage is set here for establishing the kingdom uh, when God condemned or uh, uh, judged the great prostitute who corrupted uh, the earth by her adulteries. And chapter 17 identified the great harlot Satan in an antichrist system that seduced the unbelieving world to believe the lies of Satan. Remember we said, I said, don't be sucked into that stuff. And it's so powerful to be sucked into the lies of the world. I mean, it, it will, uh, it doesn't matter how strong you are as a believer, how 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 faithful you are, that one moment can overpower your mind so quick that you'll just be sucked right into it. And that could be that could mean being around your buddies that are, you know, telling dirty jokes or talking about ugly things, talking about women in an ugly way, unrespectful way, or mean a lot of things. I mean a lot of things. Don't get sucked into it. So uh the system rules the world, and it's guilty of corrupting the world by her adulteries. That's what the harlot did. So at Babylon's judgment, that pro provoked the final outburst of heavenly rejoicing. Um, the aftermath of the destruction, uh, her destruction prompts the heavenly chorus again a second time to say hallelujah. And after the climax of her judgment, it says Babylon was burned with fire. Smoke ascends forever and ever. She'd been set on fire. It told us that back in, in 18. I don't remember the verse. Uh, we looked at it last week, but um, anyway, that, that's that's what it's referencing there. Uh, so the smoke that goes up forever and ever indicates that the judgment is final, it's permanent, and it's irreversible. So the flames eventually die out, but the judgment is eternal on the souls of those sinners that are destroyed. So the destruction of the last most powerful empire in human history marks the end of the end of man's day. Well, I was thinking of a movie I, when I said that. Huh? Yes, ma'am. We're churches, the all believers, we're gone. Now there there are believers in the tribulation, but but we today we're 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 in the clouds. Okay? You gotta keep that in mind when you're when you're looking at all this stuff. So um Oh, I believe it was the Hobbit show, which says the end of man. Y'all remember that? Maybe I just me. I don't know. <laughs> so the rebellion that began in the Garden of Eden. Think about that. The the sin that Adam and Eve com com committed in this in in the garden. It's finally ended, except for the short lived revolt that we're going to see at the end of the millennium that we'll talk about in verse in chapter 20. So there's no more false religion, no more world philosophy, no more injustice, no more unrighteousness. It's hallelujah time. All the sorry results of human depravity will be conquered and defeated. That will be a day for hallelujah. You know, you know how does it affect y'all to 
when we hear about these news stories about like that young nurse that was killed in Georgia, I mean, you know, they're just they're they're just people that that, that didn't even they didn't it didn't affect them at all. But guys, that could happen right here in Mount Selman, Texas. Uh, I talked to a young guy this week that uh, actually it was Friday morning. Friday morning, he. Uh, He's building houses, and, and he said, I asked him how it was going with interest rate and all that stuff. And he said, he's got, I said, you have, you have any trouble hiring people? He said, man, I got so many Guatemalan guys working for me. None of them speak a word of English. It's the only guys that can get to work, Guatemalan people. Sad. Humanity is pretty depraved at times. Verses 4 and 6 said, then the 24 elders, who are they? They're the, the prophets and apostles. Uh, <clears throat> 24 elders, the four living creatures, we don't really know who they are. They're probably some exalted special angels, something like that. They fell down and they worshiped God. They, they know who he is, and they know that they are to, to revere him for who he is. <clears throat> Worship God who is seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. A voice came down from the throne saying, praise our God. If you remember in Psalm 23, 1, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I remind myself of that on a daily basis. But they said, amen, hallelujah. All his servants and the ones who fear him, both great, small and great, they fell down and they worshiped him. So, uh, and, and everybody else in heaven, this, this multitude, we're, we're, I'll read about here in a minute. It says in verse 6, it says, Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude. That's the verse where they identify. That's every single believer in all of man, all of history. That's the multitude that are praising, praising God. And it said, like the sound, he said, the voice, the, 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 John said, I, I heard something like the voice of this vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters. You ever stood next to a, a waterfall that's coming 100 feet or a long way down, or a roaring river? Uh, uh, waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. So here we have the 24 elders. That they're the representatives of the church, the four living creatures. Um, they're like cherubim, this high ranking order of angels, and, and they worship God throughout Revelation. And so they now they have fallen down. They've laid prostrate in great humility, joining together with this angelic choir that cried out, Amen, Hallelujah. And, and that phrase comes from Psalm 106, 48. So the voice that came down from the throne, not identified, don't, don't really know who that is, but it's most likely an angel, an angel that uh, uh, has talked about God. We've seen some angels throughout uh, the, these last few chapters um, the voice calls out with authority for another group to join in the praise saying praise our God all you servants all you his servants you who fear him both small and great and so those redeemed believers they're called God's servants called God's servants and here's just a whole bunch of scriptures I've given you they're also identified as the ones who fear him again more scriptures there so they all that that's an all inclusive phrase there that that that's small and great. You go back to Revelation eleven eighteen. It includes everybody. Everybody, uh, it says, all of the redeemed are called to praise God. So that's the vast multitude. Every single believer throughout history, they are praising God, and it is a loud thundering sound. So I wrote, when, when the redeemed obeyed the command from the heavenly chorus, that dramatic sound that John heard sounded like a vast, great multitude. Uh, the loud chorus of praise rose to a deafening crescendo, and it sounded to John like the roar of washing, rushing waters and loud peals of thunder. And so this is the final finale to the heavenly musical composition of praise in the fourth hallelujah there in verse 6. Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty reigns. And I think we need to remember that as we... we live each day of our life and all this stuff that's going on remember that he is our god he is our lord god he is almighty and he he is sovereign and so that's followed by that 
those verses because our Lord God, the Almighty reign. We, we believe that. We have faith that that is true. And so the world system, the evil world system, it's been completely destroyed, and now God's kingdom has come into its fullness. And the use of hallelujah is reminiscent of Psalm 146 through 150. So I encourage you to go back and read those, those verses, those chapters. And so uh, they repeatedly offer praise for God's sovereign rule and his eternal fellowship with the redeemed. So we're going to be in, we're going to be in that fellowship with, with, with him and all these other uh, redeemed individuals. So our God reigns. Every knee will bow to the one who was despised and rejected by men. Philippians 2, 10 or 11 says, Every knee will bow, every mouth will confess. <clears throat> Shouts of his praise will ring through heaven. Uh, I can't imagine how wonderful that's going to be. Don't have to worry about all this stuff down here. However, you know, what does, I'm not a worrier, but what does concern me is it probably concerns all of us is what kind of world are our kids going to live in? What kind of world is our grandkids going to live in? Don't know. We can't do anything but about that except continue to stay strong and be courageous and be bold and follow Christ and deny ourselves. That's how I see it. Verse 7 through 10 says this, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride, the church, has prepared herself. How is that? How has she prepared herself? She was given fine linen to wear bright and pure for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. That's us. These words of God are true. Then I fell to at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold firmly to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's a little confusing there to me. But let's just go back to the bride. The bride has prepared herself. She was permitted to wear the fine linen, the bright and pure. And again, that's the righteousness of the saints. Uh, the entire heavenly chorus, including angels, in verse 1, the 24 elders. We see the, the four living creatures and all the hosts of the, of the redeemed. They are urged, they are exhorted to rejoice and be glad and give glory to him because all of the preparation is complete and the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's hallelujah. So that ceremony is going to come, uh, con coincide with the establishment of the millennial kingdom and it's going to stretch throughout that thousand year period. And it's going to be finally consummated in the new heaven and the new earth in 21 and we'll get there in a few weeks. So then the angel that had been speaking with John said to him, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's the fourth of seven Beatitudes in Revelation. And I'll list them here for you. So the recipients, who are the recipients of the blessing? They are the ones who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding supper of the Lamb. <clears throat> so these are invited guests and they are a distinct group from the church since a, a bride would hardly... Uh, be invited to her own wedding. So the guests represent Old Testament believers. Uh, it also mentions the prophet, all the heroes of faith in Hebrew 11. All of them are invited guests. John the Baptist, tribulation saints, glorified and still alive on earth, entering the millennial kingdom. It's going to be a big wedding, a big wedding. I think the biggest wedding I did was, was 500 were invited. At Green Acres, I had to put the suit on that I had in the back of the closet. This was going to be massive. And so the truth is, the blessed truth is, God's going to be in this personal relationship with all these redeemed saints. And that, that's really what the, our burden should be for people uh, on the earth today who don't believe. And, and our job is not to save them, it's just to give them the opportunity to receive that blessing. So those, all those pastors I talked to today, I, I, I prayed with them and you know talked about as we, we're standing on the verge of Resurrection Sunday and Resurrection Week and and, uh, uh, you know, just asking the Lord to prepare their hearts, prepare their message, the, the simplified message of the gospel. Because we're going to have people here in our church out there at sunrise service and out here here in the church on Sunday that will be one of those Easter people. That's, 
Easter and Christmas, that's the only two times anybody come to church because they come with mama because mama said, you're going to church with me. We had that one time to share the gospel with them. So, so how many times have they heard that? How many times have they come on Easter? And how many times have they gone on Easter, I mean on Christmas, to hear the simplified gospel and yet to walk out the door and continue to live the way they live? God has, a, if things happen in God's time, that's, that's the only way I, I can explain it. That's the only way I explain what happened to me and how it happened to me. And he says, those are the true words of God. In John's day, the church was being persecuted and attacked by heresies from within, and it was crumbling. That's happening today. I've got a good friend who is, I don't know what his title is, but he works for the Southern Baptist Convention in Texas. And he, he uh, lives in Seguin, and he travels all over that country down there. When Southern Springs had that massacre down there a few years ago, that, that was one of his churches. He, was, he, he had to go down there. But he, 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 he tells me they fight this all the time, uh, these churches being attacked from within. Uh, and, and a lot of times it's, it's just so petty, the things that they – I remember uh, one time walk, we went to Colonial Hills up in town, and uh, Wednesday mornings we had a, a, a men's breakfast, uh, a men's Bible study. And one morning we walked into the main sanctuary and there was four of the prettiest baby blue wing back chairs sitting up there, the, the little short pews they had up there for the song guy and the, the pastor to sit in. They're gone. Well, that night we came back to church and those chairs were gone. I went to one of my guys and I said, what's the deal? He said, somebody said we didn't vote on it. They're in a the closet. So <laughs> things like things like that can divide a church. And I'm not picking on Colonial Hills. Listen, I got saved in that church. I, I, just, so I still got a lot of friends there. But, but I'm just using that as an example, the petty thing that people can can uh, walk away from. Uh, there are churches today experiencing some of that stuff. Fortunately, we, we are blessed. We, uh, uh, we just are blessed with that, not them. Um, so... Don't do that. It says he was astonished. John was astonished when he heard the angel's message that without thinking he fell at the angel's feet to worship him. And that was a practice strictly prohibited in, in scriptures. You can go look at those two scriptures. The angel called him to his senses with a sharp rebuke and said, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold firmly to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. That that is. Uh, I, I'll be very humble when I say this, but every pastor deals with this. Every one of them. I don't care if you're a cowboy pastor, or a traditional pastor. People will put you on a pedestal, and and I, I don't. I, I'm just. I'm just like. I'm. That's what the angel said. Look, I, I'm just a servant, just like you. But that happens, and and that can. That could cause some men to be tempted to get full of themselves. It has happened. So that's what the angel's saying there. And he said, like John, the angel said, was a servant of God. He was sent to minister to John and his brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And the angel reminds John to worship God only. That's, that's who we are. We're, we're to worship God only. And, and worship is the theme of redemptive history and the purpose for which all believers were redeemed. So the angel's final word to John is a reminder that the testimony, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy all through the Old Testament and all through the New Testament. And so we just need to remember that. The central theme of the Old Testament prophecy and New Testament preaching is Jesus, period. He is, he is found in every book of the Bible. So the saving message was his message. It's still his message. Still his message. I want to read to y'all something that uh, Tom Terry gave me one day. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Tom passed away during the COVID time, <clears throat> and he, he, he gave me this on a piece of paper one day. He said, a man is no fool to give what he can't keep and to gain what he can't lose. Salvation in Jesus. Let me read it again. A man is no fool to give what he can't keep and to gain what he can't lose. God, if I'm not where you need me, leave me there. 
Please be done. That was pretty important to me, uh, number one, that he gave it to me. But uh, as I've gone through some of his books that he gave me, Miss Barbara gave me, uh, that's written in a lot of them. So the testimony of Jesus and the gospel message is the same. It's, it's all about salvation. It's about being faithful. But it says those who are not faithful will forfeit heavenly uh, affirmation of their ministry. And so the glorious reality that God will judge the wicked and usher believers into his kingdom should cause all the believers to rejoice. So it's a great time. It's going to be a great time in heaven. And uh, we'll all be there. All, all believers will be there. And uh, so, hallelujah. Hallelujah.